Okay, so I'm the next speaker. I think perhaps I win the prize for the most boring talk title, or potentially the most boring talk title, Building Data Infrastructures for Science. Very bold. But for me, data, information, and knowledge are fundamental to what this institution is about. They are absolutely crucial. Um, Dave earlier talked about his Kondretiev cycles, and I was sitting there thinking, oh, what's the next one might be? Well, for me, potentially, data, it could be that next cycle that really drives innovation. And though, so for me, our data infrastructures, the systems that we use to store and share and manage that data, are absolutely fundamental. And so what I want to do today is give you a very quick sort of tour of some of those systems and how we're developing them, and also crucial because this is really important for me, what's driving them? What are the reasons for this? What are the science that we're going to enable through these systems? So that's sort of already given you a bit of a background, really, to what, an overview of what I want to talk about. But if you'll indulge me, I want to start actually where I started, which was as a systematist. And I want to tell you a little bit about why I made the transition towards becoming interested in data infrastructures and what those enabled me to do. Then I'll go on and give you that sort of headline act on various digital systems we have within the museum, museum dealing with science data, things we're doing with them, and then if there's time, I'm going to touch on maybe what for me could be the vision that starts to begin and unite some of these activities. Because remember, we're not working in isolation. There's a huge number of other institutions trying to address precisely the same problems we are. We need some unifying theme that pulls us all this together. And in my very last slides, I'm going to speculate about that, what, what that might be. So starting off then, a bit of background or some my background, how did basically a Laos systematist, that's what I started out as, become interested in data infrastructures. So fundamentally, when I started back in about 1997, there was, um, uh, being interested in this group, there was a huge amount of information to assimilate. There's about 5,000 species of these parasites present on about uh, potentially 5,000 species of mammals, 10,000 species of birds, 12,000 associations between all of those lice and the mammals and the birds, huge amounts of data. But for me at the time, my data infrastructure basically looked like this. It was the scientific literature. There weren't any digital systems supporting me. But all the information that I needed, or a lot of it, was of course buried in these papers, which are replete with information. There's about 10,000 scientific papers on the taxonomy of parasitic lice, full of data. And at the time, the web was just coming to the fore. So people were really just beginning to explore and use the web as a tool to really do things. And this quote in particular um, stuck in my mind. It's a very old paper, but it's um, written by Dan Connolly, who sort of was one of the founders of the web, uh, involved in a lot of the initial web standards, especially XML. He said in this beautiful quote, the bane of my existence is doing things that I know the computer can do for me. Well, certainly, as a Laos systematist, when I was literally cutting things out and sticking them on the wall to try to visualize my data, I was um, very sympathetic to this problem. And so I got interested in building digital systems that would support the data within my community. And in particular, because I was working on this little group of lice and I wanted to share that information, I was um, building systems on the web with various colleagues to help share and manage that information. And the reason for that wasn't just to build those digital systems, it was to do science. And in fact, the year that probably one of my most productive years scientifically back in about 2004 also coincided with the year where most of those digital systems that we were building were in operation. So I was using the digital systems that I built and my colleagues were building and we were collectively populating to do science. And that was really my reason and my motivation for coming here. We are replete with huge amounts of basically analog information. Card indices, our library, tissue collections, slides, all sorts of enormous rich data sources. But for me, all of that data is basically in the wrong place. To really usefully do things with it in a collective way, we need to mobilize that information into various data uh, infrastructures and then do things with it. So what are the systems within the museum that we're using at the moment? So within Science Group, many of these will be familiar to you, but I know we've got a very mixed audience across the whole of the museum. So I'm just going to quickly run through a few of these. KEMU, of course, 
is the big one, probably the most important for certainly Science Group, holding all of our collections data. Right now we're putting a lot of money, investing a lot of money in making that better so we can more efficiently get information into and out of that system. We've also got systems managing some of our media assets, a little bit of a troubled project perhaps that one. Um, and another one that we'll be hearing about a lot later, Jane Smith will be talking about some of our developments in terms of our virtual library, trying to make access to literature a bit better. But for me, one that I'm really excited about and that Ben Scott will be talking about in a bit is the museum data portal. Many of our museum systems simply don't have good access to the web. They can't really talk to our website and people outside can't really do much with that data. Well, the museum data portal is being developed precisely to address that problem, both for researchers and for collections. And there's going to be a window of a huge world of possibility using that data portal. In fact, I'm going to stick my neck out and make a bet. I think the museum data portal will probably be as strategically important to us as our website is in just a few years' time, maybe as short as three years' time. It's going to be that big. So we can, you can test me on that prediction in a few years. Now, we've also had quite a lot of external investment in various museum data infrastructures. As certainly Science Group will know, we're involved in a number of big European projects, certainly I am. Vibrant is one of the big ones, building um, various and integrating various tools, supporting biodiversity data for various biodiversity communities, literally worldwide. Um, another one, a NERC funded one this time, is eMonocot. We've got many of our Q colleagues here involved in this project. eMonocot is building a sustainable integrated resource on monocot plants and it's unusual in that we're building both content and infrastructure as part of that project. Often it's quite hard to get funding to do both within the same project but eMonocot's a little bit different. Another big one, people don't normally think of synthesis as a digital infrastructure. Um, many of the science groups certainly will be familiar with a synthesis program. Synthesis 3 is starting in September. This is another infrastructure project that's normally about access to collections, physical access, and indeed Synthesis 3 still is. But there's also a significant digital access component to Synthesis 3. And this time around, we'll be looking at mass collections digitization and various tools to help facilitate facilitate and mobilize data from our collections. And there's a few other projects as well. Another big one that many people will be familiar with and also probably many of our um, external viewers will be familiar with is the Scratchpad project. This is how we within the museum have certainly um, uh, responded in, uh, and um, funded um, or, or linked into things like Vibrant and eMonocot. This is a virtual research environment, a space on the web where communities of uh, researchers can self-assemble around various topics and use this literally to store, share, and manage their data in a structured way that they can share with others. And this has been a project that's running for about five years now, has quite good usage, there's over 500 different communities using this tool. Um, what's really interesting to me is we're also beginning to pick up a lot of scientific citations. So people are beginning to cite their scratch pads in their scientific papers, and that's really important. There's a lot of um, NHM usage too, so about 120 nearly users, registered users within the NHM who are engaged in this. Okay, so what are we doing with this infrastructure? What's on our near-term horizon? Well, uh, many of you will know we've got a new science strategy covering the next five years, and basically digital is written right the way through that program. Virtually every single component has a digital element. But there's three that I'm going to pick out and just cover very quickly. Collections digitization, large-scale use of collections data, and also new approaches to biodiversity discovery. So just quickly then, collections digitization, this is kind of the easy one, it's the most obvious digital one really. This is about mobilizing data. And we've got in our science strategy this scary target, mobilizing 20 million specimens in the next five years, or making them digitally available, um, uh, quite whatever that means. 
Now, we've got a number of challenges towards doing that. At the moment, our existing data is really only about 2.8 million records, so we've got a long way to go. And we're trialing various mass digitization projects. You'll hear about the iCollections project through Daryl and through Gordon Patterson this afternoon, who are really driving this. In fact, that project is going to double the number of images that we have within KE, um, our image data, our collections database, over the course of just one year alone. Big issue really with digital collections digitization is funding. At the moment, it's costing around between one and three pounds per specimen to, do, to digitize our collections. That's quite expensive. And realistically, certainly I think that if we're going to be investing that amount of money in our, this program of work, we really need to link up to our public offer in some way, partly because that's going to help get us the money, but partly because I think there's some really interesting stories to tell about this activity within the museum. So there's various next steps there in terms of what we need to do. Probably the big thing we need to do in this area is simply get organized, and there's some activities going on to do that. Large-scale use of collections data. Basically, this is about why are we bothering to digitize? Why are we mobilizing all this stuff? There's all sorts of fairly big, high-level applications, big research questions that we can apply to these data, um, potentially. And some of these topics are here, invasive alien species, impacts of climate change, species conservation. These are the big sort of sustainability issues that um, uh, you'll see sort of written throughout the science strategy. And again, some of our science initiatives are responding to this. So they're using the data, and to some extent, they should be dictating our digitization prioritize, priorities, telling us what to digitize first so that we can make sure that we can do useful things with that data. Because otherwise, especially when we're spending that amount of money, people are going to start asking some very hard questions about why we're digitizing this stuff. The data portal is probably going to be absolutely crucial to delivering that data um, and, and making it openly accessible. And um, there's a number of sort of ICT issues surrounding storage and um, high performance computing and linking that are going to be relevant as we develop the data portal. The other big area which I think digital is going to have quite an impact on, and this is probably the most challenging, certainly for me, and I think probably for the museum, because it involves dealing with a number of new types of data that we're frankly not very familiar with dealing. We, we struggle enough sometimes with our regular data, let alone these entirely new kinds of data. Some of you will doubtless have been at Alfred Vogler's symposium on tropical biodiversity, really. I guess I take two key messages from that. Firstly, really big molecular projects, really big molecular detection of taxa of organisms is happening right now, and we are going to need to respond and engage with that program. And this is really difficult for us because of the volume of data, the size of these data sets. Metagenomics in particular really challenges the entire concept of, of what our data is. So we need to really think about, about this. this is, these are environmental sequences that we're um, sampling. The other big area, again relevant to sort of new approaches to biodiversity discovery, is this issue of um, ecological observatories, the new methods of mass collecting of data, things like satellite images, acoustic data, drones, camera traps. We actually do have some activities within the museum using some of these, and certainly at Kew as well. This is potentially going to be really big, and again, it really transforms what we think about some of the traditional data that we hold. Some of these sequencing projects are going to be generating maybe 10 terabytes of data a year, and that's per researcher, and that's just at current rates. That's a scary amount of data, and really, we're going to have some big challenges trying to deal with that. They just don't map to a lot of our collection infrastructures right now. So very last thing then, those are sort of the activities maybe over the next five years. What are we going beyond? What's the big picture? How do we link all of this stuff up? There's some really high-level thought, actually, that has been going on in this area. I'm not going to touch on all of these things now, but here are three documents, for example, that actually really um, do develop some of that thinking. GBIF, the GBIC report, perhaps Donald will be talking about that in a little bit, um, is um, a really interesting one there. New recent paper um, written by a number of people within the museum, including myself, um, biodiversity, a decadal view of biodiversity informatics. There's all sorts of strategy documents too. Now, these are okay. They provide a lot of insight. But for me, 
they lack a single clear crystal vision as to why we're doing this and how we're going to link all this stuff up. And this is sort of my provocative end slide, really, is that I think this paper that was uh, uh, published by Drew Purvis um, uh, in Nature, it's actually a commentary just a few months ago now, really potentially encapsulates to me where we're going with all of this, where we could link all of this content that we're digitizing in a very distributed way worldwide up to a single big problem. He basically, his pitch was that we should be modeling all life on Earth. And just like the climate change committees that basically wouldn't do anything without any science, they can't make any predictions without a data model, we need in biodiversity science a similar huge model with which we can start to make predictions about the natural world. Now this is probably a 30-year effort. We barely know even how to start on this problem, but this is one provocative thought as to where we're all going with that. And um, Now I'm slightly over time, or nearly over time, so I will stop there. Thank you very much. Cheers. So I'm going to take one question, if there is one, before we um, switch over to uh, Donald. Lawrence, could you give me um, Donald's USB stick? Lawrence? <laughs> Thanks. Is there any questions about that? It was a real whistle-stop tour, but in one sense, I think it, um, it also flags up at uh, a, um, a really acts as a kind of headline news for many of the um, other presentations that will follow later today, which will be delivering um, uh, uh, more details on that. Yeah. We've got a question uh, uh, from Twitter. Okay. Are you going to digitize your herbarium, or when are you going to finish digitizing it? Well, the joy with the herbarium is it's flat. So it's easy, or easier, I think I should say. So I'm probably the, the, not the best person to answer that question. But I think that in terms of um, uh, those digitization priorities, the herbarium is going to come very high up on the list. Um, Kew Gardens, of course, have similar ambitions. There is a plan to develop a, um, a UK virtual herbarium. Um, and of course, we're already digitizing some aspects of our herbarium. So all the types are in JSTOR um, as part of the Sloan project. But um, uh, I think I can't give a definitive answer, but I would say the likelihood is yes, and probably quite soon. Okay, we'd like to thank uh, Cabbage Leak for that question. <laughs> Thanks. Anything else before we move on? <laughs>